Now, throughout this course, we're going to be uh, we're going to be looking uh, throughout this course at the mechanisms that Congress has come up with over the past literally a hundred years, the mechanisms that they have set up to try to prevent, try to prevent this. Now, I think from the slides I showed you last week, uh, the Congress has not been particularly successful uh, at uh, doing this. But we are going to look at these mechanisms because your understanding of the overall economics of, gee, why it makes sense to push more income into Z, your understanding of those economics and those various mechanisms, uh, that's what allows you to both understand the forest of, gee, how the system works as well as where to go to actually figure out the details. Because yes, when I was talking before about which company is your employer, the details matter. The details matter. Okay, now uh, just to uh, try to give a, a, few, uh, a few simple examples in discussing uh, this uh, to then point to the mechanisms that are there. Now, let's uh, take a new sheet of paper. Let's say we have X. It has a subsidiary Y, and again, we'll assume this is a zero or low tax country. And we'll assume further that, uh, let's see, US, A, B, and let's assume that there's a customer, we'll call the customer C, uh, over here. So let's say that X manufactures a product, sells that product to Y, and then Y sells that product to the customer. Now, this simple example will point out a few things about the various mechanisms that we're going to be getting into. So first of all, let's say that X sells to Y at uh, 60 and Y sells to the customer at 100. There's 40 of difference. Well, when we get into the facts, we're going to have to ask questions to learn those facts. Uh, what functions does Y perform? Uh, does Y have employees? Or is it just a nameplate uh, in uh, the Cayman Islands? Does it have real people who go out and do real sales work? Does it own intangible assets? For example, customer lists, relationships, things like that. Well, the point is that these facts will either support that $60 price between X and Y, or it will suggest that uh, X and Y are, so to speak, colluding and putting an artificially low price. If we say that the price that they put into the actual documents was, let's say, 60, like I uh, said, and then 100 over here, 60 is the revenue. When X prepares its corporate tax return, it will put down 60 as its revenue and then, of course, minus expenses down to a taxable income. If this 60 is understated, then taxable profits in X are understated. 
and, and profits within Y are overstated. So this whole area of what is the proper price that related parties should transact that, in other words, what, what are the proper transaction prices for goods, for services, for interest, for royalties? That whole area is referred to as transfer pricing. And we will spend some time, a uh, couple of sessions, on transfer pricing later in the course. It's a major area. Uh, if you have, for example, a bit of interest in you know, economics as well as taxation, uh, there are a lot of companies, uh, especially among the big four and some major law firms that have major practice areas of consulting on transfer pricing. Major area. A lot of people spend 100% of their time in this area. Okay, so transfer pricing is one area. Now, X sold to Y and Y sells to C. Was that the only way that this business could have been conducted? Could X have sold directly to C? Uh, and then if, in fact, Y did perform some, re, you know, some real functions uh, that uh, maybe X could pay Y a service fee or something like that? Yeah, could have. Now, back in the early 1960s, the government, of course, realized that a lot of companies, and again, this is sort of following the expansion of international business following World War II, the government realized that, gee, there's a lot of U.S. groups that are routing sales through low-taxed foreign companies. And they had trouble figuring out how to beat on them and say, you know, gee, you got to pay us more. There was the transfer pricing uh, as a possible tool to move money from Y to X, in other words, for the IRS to try to uh, uh, move some of that profit back into X. But that was at the very, very birth, so to speak, of transfer pricing in any significant way. Um, so what Congress did uh, in the early 60s was to enact what are called the subpart F rules. What they did was they defined certain types of transactions. And they said, for example, if Y buys from a related person and the point of origination, point of destination is outside the country of incorporation, then this category of income we'll call subpart F income or tainted income or tax haven income. We'll just label, label it that way. And if Y has that kind of income, then the net income from that will be treated as income of X. It's actually income of Y, but for tax purposes in the US, it'll be treated as income of X. So this was the mechanism. Define certain types of transactions, you know, sales, 
related party somehow involved in this example as uh, the seller. And point of origination, point of destination outside the country of incorporation. And there are several other categories which we will get into in detail later. But the point was, this under this mechanism, you define certain types of transactions, and then the net income from those transactions ends up being taxed on a current basis back in the United States at the level of the, the US owner. So this, uh, this is a second mechanism, transfer pricing being the first, subpart F being uh, the second. Now, ignoring other, a few other mechanisms, the most recent new mechanism is what's referred to as guilty. Anybody know what guilty stands for? Global intangible low tax income. Wow, okay, that's great. You, uh, uh, you probably were coached somewhere on that. That's great. Okay, good. That's, uh, that's encouraging. Somebody is actually reading the book. Okay. Okay, so now, uh, the, again, the point I'm trying to make in this broad area is why are these mechanisms here and a, just a smidgen about them because we're going to go into a lot more detail later. Because U.S. headquartered groups were so adroit at getting around the subpart F rules. And because they also used to their advantage, in essence, the, the uh, transfer pricing rules, essentially Congress came up with a uh, not a fine-tuned mechanism, but rather essentially a baseball bat to just hit anything that was there. And this new mechanism, guilty, is essentially saying, uh, hey, if you have income in a foreign subsidiary, and if the level of income is more than uh, what for practical purposes will often be a relatively nominal amount. And we'll get to again later what is that usually nominal amount. Any excess over that will be treated as directly income of X, the US parent. So if if Y has income more than this relatively nominal amount, the excess will be income to X, and the U.S. currently taxes it. Now, there's, uh, there's a, a special offset involved such that under normal circumstances, the tax rate ought to be 10.5% instead of 21%. But uh, at the uh, end of the day, they're trying to take a, uh, you know, a club uh, or a baseball bat and just hit everything in sight because it's literally so difficult to fine tune anything. So, uh, so this is a third mechanism. So again, uh, corporations have been very eager and successful at moving income into foreign subsidiaries. And as a result of that, Congress reacted with various mechanisms that give the IRS tools to attempt to grab some of that. Okay, with this little bit of background, now let's go back to the slides because there's one other area that, uh, that I want to 
uh, to mention. Uh, I had shown you this slide before. Up through 2017, we had a deferral system. Money made within a foreign sub uh, would uh, be earned by that sub. It would not be taxable in the United States directly. If subpart F applied because the sub uh, conducted certain of those categories of activities, then the U.S. parent might pay some tax. But again, uh, usually the U.S. parent uh, set things up to sidestep subpart F and to be reasonably within transfer pricing uh, concepts, uh, acceptable levels of pricing so that transfer pricing wouldn't be such a big issue. So that whatever was left, uh, or whatever the foreign sub earned, essentially stayed within that foreign sub and was not taxable by the US until a dividend was paid. And as I mentioned before, when somebody asked me who uh, Tim Cook was, uh, the, uh, the multinationals basically did not arrange for their subsidiaries to pay dividends. You know, just leave the money down there. And you saw some of the figures on the many billions of dollars of accumulated uh, accumulated income overseas. So this was our former system. Effective from 2018, we go to the new system, which gives a different, uh, which has a different flavor to it. Uh, and under the new system, okay, whatever is earned by the foreign sub will, uh, will be, uh, of course, not directly taxed. And again, I'm assuming no US trader business that creates effectively connected income, no US source fixed and determinable app, uh, annual or periodical income. I'll attempt to say fee uh, and uh, uh, I'll attempt to say FEDAP uh, in the future instead of trying to say all of the uh, fixed and determinable annual or periodical income. Uh, no FEDAP income from U.S. sources. So that down in the sub, uh, there's no direct U.S. tax. Now, assuming that the foreign sub makes a small amount of money not above that relatively nominal amount that I was referring to before. Under the new system, that income in the foreign sub will never be taxable by the United States. This is referred to as the uh, participation exemption, the territorial system, uh, which is the label being put on the overall system, territorial. Yeah. Will companies then just create a lot of little subs? Uh, no, it's not a good, well, the, that gets to the question of what is this relatively nominal amount. The nominal amount is a percentage, 10% of essentially tangible assets. Now, if you look at, um, an Apple, a uh, Google, <laughs> uh, you know, companies like that, uh, do you think they're fixed asset heavy? Yeah, I mean, they're the independent contract manufacturers, they are heavy in assets, but not Apple or Facebook or Google. I mean, they may have server farms and those are not necessarily cheap, but considering the amount of money they're making, uh, it's a pretty nominal, you know, 10% of those assets. If I remember correctly, there are 
relatively new proposed regulations on how this is to be done. And uh, I believe it's based on cost uh, of the assets uh, and then applying a particular a particular set of depreciation rules to get to a to a an amount. Now I I have not looked in detail at the regulations on that point, but uh, essentially I, I'm I'm pretty sure I saw something that said something to that effect. So for a lot of the very profitable multinationals that are out there, that amount is not going to be very much, but. If a company has income which is, you know, below that at or below that threshold, then there will never be any tax on that amount. So they are able to freely distribute it to the U.S. parent. Freely distribute it, no further tax. Now, as you might imagine, if under the deferral system, there was motivation to push profits outside the United States and into zero or low taxed foreign subsidiaries. Well, gee, a territorial system with no tax at all on some amount of income, uh, that's even more motivation. So that's why we have this huge club, this big baseball bat of a new guilty mechanism to, uh, to try to, in a sense, gee, we gave you this big benefit, but we know you're going to just run with it, so we need to claw back. So this mechanism, the, the guilty mechanism is clawing back. Does this make sense from you know, a tax policy standpoint, uh, you know, I, I won't comment on that, but uh, uh, this, is, this is what we have. And again, that mechanism to pull back is, uh, is there and it only covers half of the income. Again, like I say, you know, a huge club to hit something, uh, they're just saying overall, you know, we'll give you a deduction of 50%. In other words, if you have to bring back 100 of income under guilty, we'll give you a deduction of 50, so you pay tax on 50 at 21%. Uh, that means a, an effective tax rate of 10.5% on the amount of income in the foreign subsidiary that's over that relatively nominal amount. So. This is what is, in a sense, behind this new system. Now, the new system has other features to it. Uh, if we have time uh, toward the end, we'll talk about one of them, which is referred to as the beat, base erosion uh, and anti-avoidance uh, tax. Um, uh, there's also, uh, uh, that's, uh, Section 59A. Uh, there's also uh, new rules governing what are called hybrid transactions. And again, if there's time, we'll try to cover some of those. But that's more of an inbound thing, uh, as is the beat, uh, as opposed to outbound, uh, which is our primary uh, area here. So, and that second one I mentioned, the hybrid thing, that's section 267A, 267A. And that's capital A, uh, not subsection. 